Revelation chapter number 5, verse number 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Again tonight, I want to preach on, speak to us for a little while on the names of Jesus Tonight, the Lamb of God in continuation of this thought tonight. Father, thank you for this wonderful season. What a blessing it is. What a blessing it is to be able to assemble together with the saints of God and to be able to learn more about the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Thank you, Lord, that we can be brought into remembrance of the wonderful, eternal gift of your Son, our Savior. Thank you, Lord, for taking us into consideration and allowing us to be a part of your eternal plan. And now tonight, during these few moments, may the mercy seat be crowned with the glory of God. And may it be shared and spread abroad here in this congregation. And we will thank you for all you do. Because we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Thank you. We have learned in the book of the Revelation thus far that the Lord Jesus Christ is the kinsman redeemer. As the kinsman redeemer, as the Lamb of God, he is getting ready to lift the mortgage that has been brought on this earth. And we noticed in the fifth chapter in verse number six that the Lamb is the one that took the book to redeem earth's mortgage. As a result of that, there was praise and adoration and singing before the throne of the Lamb. We noticed in verses 12, I just read the text, and also in verse number 13, the last part of that verse, that they are praising the Lamb forever and forever. So the Lamb of God is now in place. They've looked in heaven, they've looked on earth, they've looked under the earth, and they finally found someone who meets the qualifications of earth's redemption. And so we meet the Lamb again, in the sixth chapter of the book of the Revelation, and verse number one, the Bible said, And I saw, here it is, when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Isn't it amazing how John, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is constantly talking about the Lamb that has significance attached to it. So we want to find out what that significance is. Now he's been qualified as the only one that can take the taint of sin off of this cursed world. He's the only one that can bring everything to, uh, to its final consummation. So he begins his work in the sixth chapter. And verse number one, the Bible says that he opens, the lamb opens the seals. And in this chapter we notice that those seals are depicted by different riders of horses. For instance, the first horse, the rider that goes out, the Bible says in verse number 2, is a white horse rider. Now the Lord is the one, the Lamb of God is the one that allows this to be in place, to be, to be beginning, so that he can head towards the 19th chapter, which will bring about the consummation of the curse upon this earth. So we're beginning here to see the curse in the process of being lifted. But before the process is lifted, the devil has to be put in his place. And before the process is consummated, God will bring the Antichrist front and center, the beast, false prophet, front and center, only to be destroyed at his beckoning, just a little farther in the book of the Revelation. So the horses go out according to the Lamb of God. 
If you'll notice, I don't have time to get into it. I'm just dropping it in your heart because I'm moving down to give us the Lamb passages. But if you'll notice, the Bible said that there's a white horse rider in verse number 2. He goes out across the landscape. Now, we understand who that is. As we study our Bibles, as we put it all together, put it in its practical application, this white horse rider is an imitation of the Lamb of God, the white horse rider who will come in the 19th chapter of the book of the Revelation. Everything that God's got that's good and holy, the devil will have a counterfeit for it. And the counterfeit here in verse number 2 is none other than the Antichrist. If you'll notice, he's riding out across the scene on his white horse. If you'll notice, he has a bow, but he doesn't have an arrow. Which means that he's riding out with a peaceable conquest. The first three and a half years of the tribulation period will be a time of peace. In fact, it will be a time like this world has never experienced outside of the Garden of Eden. He will make a covenant with Israel. I'm so thankful that Israel's front and center today on the news. I'm grateful that Jerusalem has been declared once again to be the seat of government officially. And our ambassador will be represented there sometime two or three years later when they get everything in place. Uh, I'm grateful for that. I'll tell you why I'm grateful for it. There's a promise in the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis where God said, I'll bless them that bless you, I'll curse them that curse of you. And the blessings of God will come on America if we choose to do what's right with the nation of Israel. I believe since the 1940s, God's blessed our nation because we recognize them, first nation in the world, to recognize them as a nation among the United Nations of the world. There's going to come a day, however, when there will be a peaceable conquest. It will happen when the church is taken out. Now, I don't know if you ever stop to think about this or not, but when the church is gone for a period of time, there's going to be pandemonium. For a period of time, people's going to be wondering what in the world has happened. Now, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, and even Fox News, uh, they will get their commentators and they'll go out and uh, become commentators and they will try to describe what's happened and uh, I'm sure that they'll have it all figured out that they'll probably say that there's been collusion between the world and Russia. That's probably what they'll say, because that's about all they know. And uh, they'll be trying to figure out what's happened to all the people in this world. And then the, here comes this guy riding on the white horse, and he's got all of the answers. He'll put a chicken in every pot and a car in every carport. He's got it all put together, and he will yield peace. He will be a superhuman right out of the pit of hell itself, coming in all the deceptiveness of his, of his glory. And he will sway the world, and he will woo the world, and the world will go after him. And they'll even say, who is like the Antichrist? No one like him, they're going to say. And so they will follow him. But it is short-lived. After the white horse rider goes out, the Lamb of God starts it. The Bible says in verse number 4, then there's the red horse rider. What happens? Well, only a short period of time, three and a half years. Then the tribulation becomes the great tribulation. And there's bloodshed on this earth like this earth has never experienced before. And while people are busy fighting battles, that means there's famine in the land. So in verse number 5, there comes the black horse rider riding out across the land and there's famine because people are not raising crops, people are busy fighting and if you look at the context they're fighting each other, pitted neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation and, and so the peace treaty has ended and the bloodshed has begun and the famine has begun to take place and when there's no nothing to eat and there's famine in the land, then verse number 8, here comes the pale horse of death and death begins to really take on meaning in this world as multitudes of people are dying in the land. Now, as this happens, some of these people who are killed just decided that this is not the Christ we're looking for. And so they identify themselves with the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And we see where they end up at. In verse, uh, the Bible says, if you'll notice in your Bible, in verse number 9 of this chapter, uh, the Bible said, when we open the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. 
and for the testimony which they held. Now, I call your attention tonight to why they were killed. They were killed while the Antichrist is ruling. They were killed because uh, uh, they took a stand on the Word of God and they had a testimony that they would not back down and they would not compromise and they would not change. Uh, so the Antichrist said, take them out, kill them. Now, I want you to understand during that period of time, uh, there's a wholesale murder in the world right now. Uh, nations. Uh, I've been reading, uh, following some of the events in North Korea. You pull a Bible out in North Korea, you're, Korea, you're history. You try to preach in North Korea, you're history. Uh, he, uh, the, the dictator in North Korea, uh, had his own uncle put to death because he was afraid his own uncle was a threat to his domain. And Christians, if a person identifies as a Christian, they're gone. Now, that's only a semblance of what's going to happen when the church is taken out. The Antichrist is ruling because he considers Christianity to be a threat to his dominion. And when somebody begins to preach the Word of God and bear testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ, according to verses 9 through 11, then they are killed. But I want you to notice they end up in glory. That's not half bad. There's worse things that could happen to you than going to heaven. I mean, you could die lost and go to hell. So when you end up in heaven, that's something to be thankful for. And let me drop this in your heart, and I know you Bible scholars know this tonight, but right here's something that is a real encouragement. It has nothing to do with where I'm going. I just want to drop it in your heart as we pass by here. We learn something here in verses 9 and 10 about the people that's over in glory land. They're not just... Spirits floating around somewhere. Notice the people in the presence of the Lord. Uh, the Bible said in verse number 10, they speak, they have a loud voice. And notice this. Uh, the Bible says that in verse number 11, they had on robes. So they have an intermediate body over there that's able to communicate. They have an intermediate body over there that's able to wear a robe. And the Bible says that crowns are put on their heads, so they have a head to put crowns on. We're going to find the book of the Revelation. I give you that in passing. So we're seeing these people that are dying, and they're going into the presence of the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So watch this closely. The Lord is taking care of His own. Now I want to say it again, because that's a blessed thought. The Lord in the worst of times that's going to take place in the future still looks after and takes care of His own. When the Antichrist comes along and takes their lives, the next thing you know, they're found in glory. They're in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if He'll do that in the tribulation period, what do you, th what do you think He's going to do for us when we check out in the grace period? That's the reason Paul could rear back on his hind legs and say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And uh, he said, I'm in a strait betwixt the two, having a desire to part and to be with Christ, he said, which is far better. For we know that this earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So here they're checking out in the tribulation, and the Lord Jesus Christ is taking them to heaven. But it's kind of like a stage event. They'll pull the curtain down, and, and they'll take you to one event. And uh, they'll raise the curtain, and they, they set the stage, and they take you to another event. So here in verse number 9, it's just like the cameras are turned on up in glory. And we see these people coming up, and they're up in glory. Now the curtain comes down. And now the cameras are tuning towards planet Earth. We're seeing the goodness of God to His children, bringing them up into heaven. But now we look down here on earth, beginning in verse number 16 and, seven, 16 and 17 and the verses previous to that, and we are noticing that the Lamb of God, not only is He at work bringing His people home to heaven, but the Lamb of God is busy down here on this earth, and to the extent, in verse number 16, notice what they say about Him, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Watch this. And from the wrath 
of the Lamb. So now we see the Lamb not protecting His own. He's already done, done that. But we see His wrath now being poured out on what's taking place down here in this Christ-rejecting world. There's a phrase that's come along in the last few years from the liberals and the modernists, and you hear this all of the time, all of the time. Uh, they, they, and look, I'm thankful for the love of God. Oh, I'm so grateful tonight to be a part of His love and I'm thankful that His love has been manifested towards us. In this was the love of God manifested that He sent His own Son into this world to be the propitiation for us. I'm so thankful for that. Paul said, the love of Christ constraineth me. I'm grateful for the love of Christ. Well, my friend, I want you to understand something. Uh, that love of Christ can immediately be turned into the wrath of the Lamb. And you don't hear, you know what the liberals today say? Well, we ought to be inclusive of everyone. We ought to accept everybody as they are because God loves everybody. Yeah, and He does. But He's the one that put the standard. He's the one that put, uh, He's the one that raised up the standards. He's the one that said, come out from among them. He's the one uh, that said, be ye holy, for I am holy. He's the one that drawed the line of demarcation. He's the one that said concerning this crowd that they want us to accept in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and such were some of you. When they got cleaned up, my friend, uh, uh, then uh, God accepted them, but until they got cleaned up, they happened to be on His wrath list. John chapter 3 verse 18 tells us the same thing. Well, I've, I've done a lot of debating uh, some of this crowd and then on uh, ask the pastor and and some of this liberal crowd they well you know God loves everybody and we've got to love it we, we can love them but we cannot love their sin I ran into this yesterday I serve on the board as you know North Carolina Christian School Association we actually had a Christian school and I put Christian school in parenthesis we actually had last year a Christian school down in the Sand Hills, Southern Pines, that had a, uh, trying to think what they called it, black tie banquet, I believe is what they, bow tie banquet. And they've been doing it for years. And when you look at the advertisement, they're, you come and they're raising money for the Christian school. And it's in the name of the Christian school. They're offering wine, alcohol, beer, you name it all. It's on the same page that they got advertising Christian school. And they're having liquor consumption and advertising their Christian school. Now, that's like a heavenly devil. That's like grape nut flakes. It's not grapes nor nuts. And so we came together as a board and said, this won't fly. We're not going to accept that, North Carolina Christian School Association. And uh, so uh, the president and uh, those in charge sent a letter. And uh, as a result, uh, the, the Christian school decided this year that uh, that they would no longer want to be a part of the North Carolina Christian School Association. But what bothered me was we had some folks that were soft on it. And just, just kind of crawled around and said, well, you know, uh, the man who's, the, uh, who's, the, who's over that Christian school, this is what I heard yesterday. The man that's over that Christian school, uh, he uh, he believes in abstinence and he don't drink and and they teach there in the school abstinence. But they this has been an ongoing thing and they just do it once a year and they sell alcohol to raise money for the Christian school. And uh, he said to me, this guy he's he's against what they're doing, uh, but because he's in the position he's in, he, he went before the board and the board said, no, we're not going to quit doing it. We've been doing it too long to stop it now, and it raises a lot of money. And so it came up in the meeting yesterday, and they said, 
uh, he's a good man, and you know that's that's between him and them. And I couldn't handle it. I just had to say, wait a minute. Let me tell you, you can't have it both ways. You can't. He may be a good man, but if he was a good man, he'd have a backbone. And if he had a backbone, he'd say, we're not going to do this. And if you're going to continue to do this, I'm going to melt my horse, tip my hat. I'm going to ride off in a different direction. I'm not going to do this. Now, that's the philosophy and the mentality of this generation. Let's be inclusive. Uh, let's just accept everybody as they are. Now, look, I believe God cleans people up. I believe when people get saved, uh, they, uh, Bud Robertson used to say, they, they don't tie their horse up in, at the hitching rail in front of the bar anymore. Uh, I just believe people get saved, they get changed. But uh, they talk about the love of Christ. And they, they actually make a mockery out of the love of Christ. And what they fail to understand is, it was our sins that put him on the cross. Therefore, that lifestyle and that sin must be detestable to God for him to turn his own back on his own son and let him be sin for us and suffer the full consequences of our weight for all of eternity. My friend, that's what God thinks about sin. There's no way in the world we can tolerate it. When God detests it. And here we find this balance in the book of the Revelation. God is love. He's bringing his folks. And by the way, before we get into this in the fifth chapter, the rapture took place back in the fourth chapter in verse number one of the book of the church has gone out. And the people that went out in the church, they loved the Lord Jesus Christ enough to say, hey, we're on your side. We're going to trust you and we're going to heaven and everybody here that's having to go through this and being rejected now, they are there and being rejected by choice. They didn't have to be here, but they chose to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And now they're experiencing the wrath of God. And every liberal, loving, liberal today, that I don't care who they are or where they're at, it talks about this love of God, and they preach universalism, that and when it's all said and done, and the heavens have passed away, and there's no more earth, that we are all God's children, and we are all going to be together in His presence. That's a lie that hatched right out of the center of hell itself. There's nothing farther from the truth than that. Jesus said, looked at the religious crowd of his day, and he said, You are of your father the devil, and the works, his works you will do. Now, we see here, we see the two sides of it. We see the verses uh, 9 and 10 and 11. Uh, these people uh, have identified with the Lord, and they're in his presence. But now uh, the Lamb of God's breaking these seals. Chapter 6, verse number 1. The Lamb of God is opening these seals. And notice what's happening in verse number 12. When he opened the seal, think strange things begin to happen here on this earth. Now I want to say to you tonight, I'm glad I just read about this. I'm never going to experience it. And here's what the people on this earth, the, uh, I got a little house over yonder in the mountains. And uh, there's a guy over there that lives, he's lived up there in the mountains all of his life. And uh, he's, uh, he, he, I, I love to be around him, but he's different. He, he's, he's a typical mountain guy, and uh, he calls us down here bottom dwellers. <laughs> bottom dwellers. Uh, he's, uh, he, 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 I never will forget, uh, he was talking one day uh, uh, to some folks up there, and he pointed back over in a certain section of the woods over there, and he said, now they still, and this is in Wilkes County, of course, and he said, they still make white liquor right back over in there. But he said, we tithe on it. <laughs> I guess he considers the money's been in the hand of the devil long enough, and it's time to get it out of there. Now, I want you to notice something here. Again, if you're saved, you don't have to worry about this. But it ought to burden us pertaining to those who will be here. He, the Lamb of God, chapter 6, verse number 1. The Lamb of God opens now the sixth seal. And when he does, the Bible said there's a great earthquake. Have you noticed how many earthquakes has taken place in this world now? In the Gospel of Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus Christ said, You can know that the end is near by the amount of earthquakes that's taken place. Man, there's tremors everywhere. This whole world has got a curse on it. And this earth itself is trembling and shaking. The Bible said in Romans chapter 8, waiting for the day of deliverance. 
And here a huge earthquake takes place. And when it does, the sun becomes as black as sackcloth of hair. And the Bible said the moon became as blood. It didn't say it was blood. But the only way, under the right inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he could, he could declare what was taking place up in glory. He said, the moon looked like blood. I want you to understand something. That'll get your attention. I want you to know something else. When he looked up and they looked up, the Bible said that the stars start falling out of their sockets. Uh, just like a fig tree will cast her untimely figs uh, when she's shaken by mighty wind. Can you get a picture of that in your mind tonight, looking up uh, in, the, in the sky and looking out across the universe, uh, and the stars are falling out of their sockets, the moon looks like it's blood, the sun is as black as sackcloth of hair, the earth beneath your feet are, is trembling and shaking, uh, and the Bible says that the heaven is departed like a scroll when it's rolled together, and the mountains and the islands begin to move out of their places. I want you to understand, my friend, there's no big boys there. When that's taken place, and I'll tell you why. The Bible said in verse number 15 that the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man. I want you to notice what happens when the Lamb of God pours out His wrath. The Bible said that they hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Uh, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. I want you to understand something. This, this, this Lamb of God is a Lamb of love, but he's a Lamb of wrath. And you better make sure you're on the right side of that equation. They ask a question in verse number 17. The great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand the wrath of who? The wrath of the Lamb of God. Jesus, in the Gospels, Matthew 24, said that people's hearts would fail them for fear, looking at what was coming upon them. You know what's going to happen right here when, the, when God's shaking this earth? You know what's going to happen here as you tie the Scriptures together? When the, when the stars are falling out of their sockets, the moon's like blood, the, the sun's like sackcloth of hair, the earth is shaking beneath the feet, the mountains are falling and the islands are disappearing out in the sea. When people are seeing that, they're falling over, they're dying with massive heart attacks. It's more than they can comprehend. It's more than they can take in. They've never seen anything like this. What's happening? The love of God has been turned into the wrath of the Lamb. And they raise the question, who can stand? The, question, the, the truth is, no one can. No one can. So what does God do? Well, God said, I need a little preaching down there on planet Earth. God's always been into this preaching business. He, was, he, he sent his son down here. His son was a preacher. Uh, Jesus uh, sent the twelve. They were preaching. And seventy went out. And they were preaching. And on and on and on throughout the Bible. The preaching is important. So the Lord said, I'm not going to leave myself without a witness. I'm going to give you another opportunity. So in chapter number 7, I want you to notice what happens. In chapter number 7, it said after this, uh, the Bible said that there's 12,000 Jews... Uh, from the, each of the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, the doctor theologian uh, has said down through the years that the twelve tribes have lost their identity and nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows where they are. What they should have said is, so far as we know. Because God knows where they are. He knows where every one of them's at. And during the tribulation, he's going to tap them on the shoulder. And he's going to say, go out and start preaching. So 144,000 Jews. I think Donald Trump's trying to get them ready for the tribulation. 144,000 Jews will start preaching right here on this earth. They're preaching the kingdom. They're preaching about what's about to come to pass. Isn't that amazing? Today they live in the land blinded. 
The natural branches have been broken off and wild olive branches have been grafted in. But Paul said in the 11th chapter of Romans, if the natural branch can be broken off and a wild olive branch broken in, uh, grafted in, don't you know that the natural branch can be put back in again? Amen. And I believe God has got his knife and he's whittling right now. And he's getting ready to put that natural branch right back in there. Because a nation, the Bible says, is going to be born in a day. They're going to see Jesus. They're going to see the, the marks of the slaughter in the fifth chapter of the Revelation. They're going to see those marks on his body. And they're going to say, wow, where'd you get those marks in the book of Zechariah? And he's going to say, this is where I was wounded in the house of my friends. They're going to believe. They're going to repent. They're going to trust. They're going to receive the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. They're going to recognize that they've been waiting for him to come. And he had already come. And he's already here. And they're going to accept him. And he's going to tap 144,000 of them on the shoulder. And they're going to go out. And they are going to preach during the tribulation period. And in Revelation chapter number 7 and verse number 9, we find the Lamb of God again. Watch this. And this uh, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne. Watch this. And before the Lamb. Wow. Who are these people? These are people who are saved as a result of the preaching of 144,000. Now let me put a word of caution in here. And I hope you'll listen well. We hear two extremes here. We hear somebody say, we hear somebody say this. Well, you know, you'll have plenty of opportunity if you miss the rapture. You'll have plenty of opportunity to get saved. Let's put the Bible in its proper context. The Bible's clear. There will be people saved after the rapture. But the Bible is clear, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that the people who have heard and rejected will be sent strong delusions. They will believe a lie, and the lie is a personification of the Antichrist. He's a person. He's a liar. And they will believe the lie instead of believing the truth. You say, well, how could there be so many people here in the presence of the Lord? Because there's more people in the world this very minute that's lost than there are saved. And many of those people right now that are lost, all they know is Buddha, and all they know is Mohammedanism, and all they know is uh, some kind of a false cult, and uh, they don't know what you know tonight. They don't know what we know tonight. Uh, they're, they're blinded. The Bible said the devil has blinded the minds of people unless they should believe and hear the glorious gospel of Christ and, and be saved. And they've chosen to be blinded. They've chosen not to get saved. Uh, and they've heard the message. And as quick as the rapture takes place, there'll be strong delusions sent into their hearts and in their minds. Uh, and uh, they won't believe. They won't have a desire to believe. But there's going to be marriage of people who've never heard, but they're going to hear the preaching of these 144,000. And here's proof positive that as a result of their preaching, there's going to be great multitudes, watch this, which no man could number. And watch where they're coming from, not just from the United States of America. I'd venture to say there wouldn't be a lot of people saved in the United States of America after the rapture simply because this nation has been saturated with the gospel, saturated by print, saturated by media, ministry. Uh, listen, no one who lives in America has a legitimate excuse to die and go to hell. No one. Uh, people here should know, they can know, they've been given the gospel over and over again. But coming out of all of the nations and the kindreds and the people and the tongues of the world, there will be uh, an innumerable group of people. Notice what the Bible says. They will stand before the Lamb. Amen. Here's that Lamb again. In verse number 9, they're standing before the Lamb. And you know what they're doing? They're giving God glory for the salvation that got them in. Look at the next verse. And they cried with a loud voice saying, here it is, salvation. 
to our God. Isn't that wonderful to know that during this period of time, they're going to be, the word salvation means they've been salvaged. They've been, they've been salvaged from the Antichrist. They've been salvaged from the beast. They've been salvaged from the false prophet. Most importantly, they've been salvaged from the pits of hell because they have believed the message of the 144,000 and they're in the presence of the Lamb. And they're praising, they're praising the Lamb. By the way, sweet Baptist, uh, by the way, dead Baptist, by the way, quiet Baptist, you're going to join in and do the same thing. You need to start learning. You need to start learning. They're before the Lamb. And then verse number 10, they testify, uh, they cried in a loud voice, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, watch this, and unto the Lamb. Why? They realize that salvation came by the Lamb, by the, by the Lamb of God. Now, John's kind of called up in heaven, he's watching all this. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't it be something to have a front row seat seeing what's happening? John's caught up, and the question comes, who are these people? Who are these people that's praising the Lamb for salvation? Who are, who are this, who is, who's this great multitude of people up here in glory? Where did these people come from? More importantly, how did these people really get up here? That's the question. I'm so glad they gave us the answer. Look with me in verse number 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. They, they've washed their robes. They've made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. How'd they get up here? They took a blood bath. What kind of blood bath? They took a bath in the blood of the Hey, the blood of Jesus Christ not only works in the day of grace, the blood of Jesus Christ works during the tribulation period to those who haven't heard the message uh, and they believe the preaching of 144,000. And John's standing over there and he's seeing these people just coming up from planet Earth and he's watching them. Can you get a mental picture of that? He's standing over there somewhere in glory. He's been called up and he's watching all of these people coming up down here uh, from down here on earth. Where in the world are these people coming from? How did they get up here? These are those that came out of great tribulation and they got up here because they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah 10,000 times over. Whether it's a day of grace or whether it's tribulation period, if you get to glory, you get to glory by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. <laughs> And notice with me, please, verse number 15. Therefore, are they before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in the temple? And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. That's his presence. Uh, they said, wait a minute. We traded the Antichrist off for the Lamb. Amen. By the way, that's a good trade. Amen and amen. That's a good trade. <laughs> Hallelujah. And notice, if you will, please, getting up there means in verse number 16, they got a shepherd that watches over them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them any more, nor any heat. That's what's happening in tribulation period. God's pouring his wrath out down here. The Lamb of God's pouring out his wrath. It's all behind them now. I said, it's all behind them now. And I'll tell you something. When that spirit on the inside of you starts kicking up and, and says, hey, I'm ready to get out of this old body, and this old body runs out of fuel, and we step into the presence of the Lord, everything down here, hallelujah, is going to be all behind us then. And everything's going to be in front of us, and everything that's behind us won't ever be in front of us again. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. Verse, verse 15 uh, and, and, and 16. But watch verse 17. Here it is in closing. For the Lamb. <laughs> 
Hallelujah. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, watch this, shall feed them and shall lead them. He's a shepherd. Under living fountains of waters. <laughs> and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Hallelujah. You know what's happened to these folks? They've shed a lot of tears. You know why the context says this? They saw the best and the worst of the Antichrist. They saw him during a time of peace. They saw him during a time of war. And they saw the power of hell and the power of the devil here on top side of this earth. We see it a lot today too. But they see it even more. But they took their stand for the Lamb of God. They're caught up into heaven. And when we get up there, the Lord draws close enough. He takes his hand and he wipes the tear away. That's getting close to the Lamb. The Bible said in the latter part of the book of the Revelation that he's going to wipe every tear again. And thank God there will come a day when there will be no more. Listen closely. The book of the Revelation is a book of no mores. No more death. No more crying. No more tear. No more heartache. It's all gone. No more. Weeping may endure for a morning, moment, but joy cometh in the morning. We are in the process of weeping now, but we're going to trade it off. We're going to trade it off for joy just around the corner. Who made it possible? The Lamb of God. From the first of Genesis, 27 times in the last book of the Bible, God wants us to know the Lamb of God is going to straighten it all out. I hear my dear wife back there laughing. She won't be in a wheelchair. She knows I'm talking about her. She knows what I'm talking about. Honey, we're going to have it all straightened out when we get home. Because of the Lamb. Hallelujah for the Lamb. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Let's stand with our heads bowed. The Lamb's here tonight to help you. He's present and He's now present to minister to our needs. He wants to minister to us. The, look, you can say in the book of the Revelation, the sufficiency of the Lamb, because the Lamb is sufficient. If others need to come, get around this altar tonight, just praise the Lamb. Just say thank you to the Lamb of God. Or ask Him to help you tonight. I'm glad he's available. Thank God for the Lamb. Jesus, we love you tonight. Thank you for these wonderful passages of Scripture. What an encouragement. Bless us as we sing. Thank you for these who've come. Minister to them. Minister to others in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 284. Who at my door is standing, patiently drawing near, entrance within demanding, whose is the voice I hear? Are you thankful for the Lamb tonight? Hallelujah. You know the Moravian brethren, 
They've moved a long ways from their moorings. But they got this little symbol. If you see, sometimes you'll see them around Winston Salem. They got this little symbol they put on the back glass. They put on the bumper of their car. It's got a picture of the lamb with a cross over it. And it says, the lamb has conquered. I like that. I only wish they knew that. But I like it. And he has.